Hello and welcome uh, to our very first Cambridge Big Questions of Term. Um, Cambridge Big Questions is a space where we ask the biggest questions um, about life, about meaning and about the claims of Christianity. Uh, my name is Dorothy. Um, I also have a bit of a laggy camera, so apologies for that. But fortunately, you're not hearing from me for most of this time. Um, I'm a second year law student at Trinity Hall, and I'm going to be taking us through this evening um, as we go along. Uh, so today, we are looking at the evidence for Jesus's resurrection. Around 2000 years ago, uh, people across history and across the world have claimed that a man named Jesus from Nazareth rose from the dead. But could this be true? Is it the greatest hoax of all time, the greatest deception? Was it a heist as disciples stole the body from the tomb? Or could it possibly be history? We're going to be questioning this Easter story at the beginning of this Easter term with Dr. Peter Williams, who's with us today. For some background, um, Dr. Williams is um, principal of Tyndale House, um, which is largest research centre and library of the Bible. Um, Dr. Williams was also um, works with the university as an affiliated lecturer um, with the Faculty of Divinity um, and has done a lot of research into this topic. So uh, a brief outline of um, this um, event just before we hand over to Dr. Williams. Um, we're going to hear from um, Dr. Williams for about 20 minutes um, as he talks about the evidence and the big objections to this great claim of history. We'll then have about 20 minutes um, for a Q&A. Um, that Q&A is a link to something called Pigeonhole, um, which you can find in the description of this YouTube video um, down below. Do put your questions in as you go. Um, do upvote questions. Um, they're all anonymous, so do really get involved and we'd love to hear from you. After that Q&A, we're just going to have a brief interview with a Cambridge student, Abby, um, as we ask, so what? what you know what what consequences um does this um claim um have um so um yes without further ado um at this point i'll hand over to Dr. great Ian. well good evening uh, hopefully everyone can uh, hear me and hopefully my powerpoint should be uh uh coming up on uh, screen which i'll share with you on the subject of uh jesus's uh, resurrection so i can't yet see that but hopefully uh you can um, just waiting for tech guys to uh, make sure that that is uh, visible or to let me know somehow that it is visible. And otherwise, it's there. Great. OK, I just can't see it. That's fine. Um, that's going to be interesting. Um, so what I want to do is talk about the um, resurrection tonight. And I want to start with some objections to the um, resurrection, uh, namely that uh, the uh, essentially regarding what's miraculous and the idea that miracles can't happen. So when we look at the various um, objections that people can make, often there's a sort of objection that Isaac Asimov made quite famous, which was that nothing, um, no amount of evidence could ever be enough for uh, someone to believe a miracle. Or if you like, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Um, or extraordinary proof. Um, it's a great sounding idea. Um, the only problem is that um, the, the word extraordinary isn't really defined. Different groups have different definitions of what extraordinary is, and a lot depends on your background um, beliefs uh, for that. Uh, to give you another way of putting an objection, uh, people might say, well, science couldn't work if we allow fairies and pixies and anything unpredictable in uh, so that all collapses so that's another reason for not having uh, supernatural uh, the first objection there is any explanation is more probable than a miraculous one you remember the famous um, Sherlock Holmes quotation once you've eliminated the impossible whatever's left however improbable must be the truth and so you can say well a resurrection is impossible so I'm going to go for any explanation of um, how Christianity started which is not going to involve that um, another, another way of looking at this is simply that science is really beautiful. It gives you beautiful predictability and simplicity, effectively, as you uh, discuss the universe. And if you have miracles come in, that complicates things. So just a few thoughts on that by way of, of, of starting off. Um, one is, as I've said, extraordinary isn't defined. So for a um, for some people, the idea that conscious things like us 
have emerged from non-conscious things doesn't strike them as needing an extraordinary level of proof. They think, well, provided you can show that it might somehow be possible, there might be some peer-reviewed paper somehow that suggests there might be a pathway to that, it's okay. Um, what people don't say is, hey, I need to have an extraordinary level of proof before I'd even begin to believe that. Um, so it, it all depends on what you define as extraordinary. Secondly, your antecedent beliefs uh, uh, affect your judgment of probability. So, for instance, if you already believe that there is an almighty God in charge of the universe, then believing that he raised someone from the dead is uh, less, uh, fits better with what you already believe than if you believe in a totally atheistic, materialistic universe, in which case, why on earth would you have a miracle um, of a supernatural kind coming in there? So, Again, your anterior beliefs and their probability feed into this decision. But I'd say, and this is what I want to major on as a, um, a Christian, actually, when Christians believe in miracles, they're not believing in random disturbances of order. They're actually believing in things that form a pattern and that form a message. And we're, we're wired as humans to recognize patterns and recognize messages. Uh, even if we're in the sciences, we still ascribe attention, intention, sorry, to our supervisors, our academic supervisors, what do they want or whatever. Um, we actually are, are wired to pick up messages. And one of the arguments the Christians make is not that God just randomly pokes his finger in every now and then and messes things up, but actually that God is speaking to us. So that's all by way of introduction on miracles. But let's establish a little bit of what we know about Christ. And I want to use just one Roman source uh, for this. This is Tacitus, Cornelius Tacitus, Roman historian, writing about the great fire of Rome in the year 64, uh, and talking about what happened to Christians then. And he uh, talks about Christus, the founder of the name, had un undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius, that's emperor, uh, from the year 14 to the year 37, by the sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilatus, while Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea from the year 26 to, th to the year 36. So that just allows us to tie down things a bit. And it says, and the pernicious superstition, he doesn't like Christianity at all, was checked for a moment, only to break out once more, not really in Judea, the home of the disease, but in the capital, that's Rome itself, where all things horrible and shameful in the world collect and become fashionable. So he confirms a certain amount without looking at any Christian documents at all, that there's this guy, Christ, who's executed sometime between the year 26 and the year 36 in Judea. And it seems like that suppressed things and then it breaks out again. Uh, and that's uh, what he says. And that fits very much with what we know uh, from Christian sources as well. Of course, most of the people writing about early Christianity are Christian uh, Christians. And in fact, what you can say when you look at early Christianity is we've got a huge number of documents. You've got 27 different documents in a New Testament, uh, all of which come from within the first century of Christianity, arguably the first century uh, AD. And we've got four accounts of Jesus's life. That's as many accounts as you have of the Roman emperor Tiberius. Um, and on the whole, they're closer in time than the records we have of Roman Emperor Tiberius. We've also got a, an early history of early Christians. That's the book of Acts, 18 different letters and an apocalypse, which is quite an exciting book. Um, and some of these documents are actually in place by about the year 50. I want to give you just one document, probably written around the year 55. That would be a pretty standard dating for this, where uh, Paul, who's an early Christian leader, writes to people in Corinth in Greece. And he says, I want to remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you. So he preached them some years earlier, which you received, in which you stand and by which you are being so saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received. So in other words, he had got it from others uh, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, I died. Then he appeared to James, that's half-brother of Jesus, in my understanding, uh, then to all the apostles. So in other words, someone around the year 55 writing to people in Greece and saying, you know, there were lots of people who saw Jesus uh, risen from the dead, and this has been something that's been handed down uh, from the very beginning. It's not um, not a big gap in time. Now, one of the things we can also establish from early Christian sources, and no one seems to debate this, is, sorry, oh, um, yeah, <laughs> 
sorry, going to go on there, is that um, there the, the tomb of Jesus seems to be empty, that, that there is no body found. Now, of course, there are various ways of getting rid of a body. You could imagine that some people stole a body, not that bodies have much, much um, sort of commercial value back then there quite heavy but you people you can imagine some people stealing a body to try and make it look like Jesus had risen from the dead and that in one sense might explain why no one ever finds a body of Jesus but what it doesn't do is explain all of the various accounts there are of people having seen Jesus risen from the dead I've just given you um here some of the variety that there are of accounts of Jesus risen from the dead. That is, he appears in the north in Galilee and in the south in Judea. He appears in the town, in the country, indoors, outdoors, by prior appointment, without prior appointment, all sorts of different ways to different groups at different times. Um, and this is rather different from the idea that I might just be looking into the distance and vaguely catch someone, uh, I think I saw them, or, um, oh, I think I could see a, a, a bit of shadow there, or I think I could see a statue moving. What's happening in each of these reported encounters is that there's actually conversation back and forth. A speaks to B speaks to A, that sort of thing. Um, and, and therefore, it doesn't come into the sort of categories of possible optical illusions a, a, and so on. There are varied literary accounts, and they're not all dependent on each other, which seem to go back to a number of different people claiming that they have encountered not just sighted but encountered jesus risen from the dead so those two things together the empty tomb plus the encounters with jesus are rather more striking because you, you could explain why a tomb was empty on its own um or you could explain possibly a, a sort of uh maybe viral idea that people had encountered jesus but the the two uh, together uh look uh, far more solid as uh, something that really needs to be explained in some way. It's not just a typical whodunit. You can look at conspiracy explanations for this with Jesus, and you. but um, what I think you need to encounter, uh, uh, re re wrestle with is that when you look at these records of the risen Jesus, it does seem that these people at least sincerely believe that they saw the risen Jesus. Most people who've looked into the subject at least think, they may not think that they're, they're factually correct, objectively correct, but they at least think that these people believe that they had counter, encountered the risen Jesus. If you want it to be a conspiracy where some people do a hoax and they make it look like Jesus is risen from the dead, even though he isn't, you've got to remember they don't really have very long to plan it. Um, the last week of Jesus' life before crucifixion is arguably the most carefully or most detailed documented week in the ancient world, in antiquity, uh, in terms of the different accounts we have. And people can have very detailed discussions about the chronology uh, of that. If you're going to have Jesus rise from the dead and you're a follower of his, the very best thing is not to let him get killed in the first place, uh, because it's going to be a whole load harder when the Romans have done their uh, pro professional execution work. Um, to have someone rise from the dead. And, and 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 the idea that they, like the Romans, half killed someone and that someone managed to make uh, a triumph story out of that isn't going to work uh, very easily either. So um, in terms of coming up with your hoax, you really don't have very long, and it would be far better to sort of um, fight to make sure that your leader wasn't captured in the first place or something like that. Could it be a sincere delusion? Well, that doesn't explain the empty tomb, but also... The idea that some group might hallucinate doesn't quite work because group hallucination doesn't exist. I mean, I hope you're not doing drugs, but if there's a whole load of you sitting around doing drugs in a room, hallucinogenic drugs, you won't all have the same hallucination. Um, so that won't really um, explain it. And if someone did think that they saw um, someone who is a Jesus lookalike after Jesus had died, the most obvious thing within the mindset of Jews at the time would be that they were seeing someone's angel, someone's replica um, uh, in heaven or something like that, not that they were seeing the person themselves. So for all sorts of reasons, um, it's unlikely people are going to come up with this and uh, uh, that it's going to work. But I want to look a little bit more deeply at this whole question of um, the resurrection as an anomaly, because I've been presenting it as a bit like an anomaly. There's this mystery to be explained, and that's often how Christians talk about it. Uh, you know, how do you explain the empty tomb? How do you explain the resurrection appearances? It all seems a bit uh, of a strange um, combination. And it could be a bit like a haunted house. Uh, how are you going to explain this? 
And someone could say, well, look, I've got my regular science, my test tubes, whatever it is I go in and I do. And that's all very solid. And I believe in that sort of stuff. You're trying to get me to believe in this weirdo religious sort of stuff where, you know, spooky things happen like resurrections. Um, uh, why on earth would I want to do that? <clears throat> well, what I want to say is that when Christians talk about the resurrection, they're not saying we want you to believe in this pattern of everything normal to do with science and regularity. And now we want you to add an exception into that, an anomaly into that. Actually, what Christians are saying is that the resurrection forms a pattern. It's part of a whole pattern of things in Christianity that makes sense as a story, that makes sense of life and that makes sense of the entire world. So that's what I want to come on to do. I want to start with the fact that Jesus is um, a rather remarkable person in lots of different ways. I want to start with just the people group he comes from. He's a, he's a Jew. Everyone acknowledges that. And Jews, just in terms of their um, long, uh, the longevity of them as an identifiable people group is quite remarkable. They have a really remarkable history and they have a whole load of, of achievements. I mean, when, when you look at the Nobel Prizes for economics and about 40 percent of the people who've received that uh, are, are Jews. This is just phenomenal, particularly since this is a uh, people group that had so much of their um, assets plundered um, during the Nazi regime. Uh, many people had nothing after that and so on. And yet we see consistently this amazing set of achievements. And it's not just this. We could point through the whole of history to uh, lots of very remarkable uh, things. There hasn't been another um, Middle Eastern uh, group that has had as uh, originating from the Middle East, which has had as much influence, for instance, on um, medieval culture in England. Um, th th there's been all sorts of influence uh, that, that come. So I want to say it's not just any old person. It's someone who comes from a rather special um, uh, group. And when we look at that, that, that group actually has a rather remarkable um, set of national literature. It's called the Old Testament. So uh, you can you can go and look at it and there's nothing uh, quite like it in terms of other literature around the world. You can go to um, lots of other ancient literature and I study lots of ancient literature, but there's something, um, well, a number of different features of the um, Old Testament, which are, are rather striking in terms of arguably the first people doing recorded continuous chronological history, uh, arguably, well, there's no national literature which criticizes its own people uh, quite as much and so on. But within that set of texts, you can also find things which will talk like this text in Isaiah chapter 53 about a figure. And this is clearly written hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus comes along, who is dying on behalf of his people. And it will use quite a few different words. I've bolded for dying, grave, death, cut off from the land of the living. And then we'll talk about this figure as existing afterwards. Uh, there's towards the end of that passage prolonging his life. You can look that up afterwards. And there are other texts which are doing similar things. So in other words, it's not that Christians are coming and saying there's this something that's completely um, unfitting with anything that's come before. Actually, Christians are saying the resurrection fits a pattern of expectation that's been built up because what has happened through this first bit of, 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 of history, the Old Testament, is God has chosen this people and shown that a number of things won't work, whether you give them big government, whether you give them small government, uh, whether you give them your laws or social reformers, none of those will work to tackle the sin which is inside uh, humans. So actually, that's all driving towards I think a climax part of the story where God says, I need to come in myself. Um, now, as you read uh, uh, to the story of Jesus, it's a rather striking thing that he's called Christ. Christ is uh, Greek for um, the Hebrew word Messiah, which means anointed one, which is the word for the special king who had delivered the Jews. Now, it seems that Christ was called Christ before he died. Um, why would I say that? Well, one is, of course, the Christians are called Christians really early on. You saw that in Tacitus. Um, so somehow this name's getting uh, caught up really early. The idea that Jesus is um, the deliverer of the Jews arguably is something that ha goes back to his own lifetime. And therefore, um, that's rather striking because it's not just anyone whose bodies die um, gone and, every and not just anyone who's 
some people think they've seen risen from the dead, but someone who chose 12 disciples, which is a very important number um, in uh, t terms of uh, Judaism, because there were 12 tribes, and is presenting himself as the new king. And that's almost certainly politically why he was crucified, because of some claim of kingship. So it's not just any old person. It's actually someone who, even if you look at it from secular history, has probably claimed, claimed kingship of this remarkable people group. So uh, we then go on and there are other things that cluster around Jesus. There are more miracle reports about him than about any other uh, person uh, from antiquity. And they are closer in time to him. And you can look at the patterns of these and they don't all come from one source. They're not all coming from um, the, the, the usual ways that people try and explain uh, these sorts of things uh, uh, of having arisen through a long oral transmission over time. That's not what's going on here. Um, it does seem that he is from a royal household. At least uh, he seems to have claimed that. People seem to have claimed that um, at an early time. So it's not just that this is, again, anyone random. It's someone who happens to come from a royal household of this very special people group. And then we could look a little bit more and we could say, and it does seem there's this very early claim that he is born in Bethlehem, which is the place where the ancient king of the Jews, David, was born. And also where you have something written five or six hundred years before, actually more, um, the, the, the time of Jesus, um, which says that Bethlehem, I just want to read this to you, will be a place which is very small and is going to have a future ruler. Uh, uh, born there and i'll just read this but you O bethlehem ephratha who are too little to be among the clans of judah from you shall come forth for me one who is going to be ruler over israel who's coming forth of his is of old from ancient times that's a bit of a mysterious way of talking about someone who's going to be born in the future whose origin is from of old and of course that fits very well with the story that um christians understand about jesus being god coming into the world in human flesh. But there's a little bit more we can say. That is that Jesus is credited with remarkable teachings. I don't read Chinese, but it looks pretty, so I'll put it there. Um, here we have um, come from Confucius Analex, something like this. Now, this is written a few hundred years before Jesus. What you do not want yourself, do not force on others. Seems a very good rule. Or what you do not want to, uh, to do yourself, do not force onto others. That's sometimes called a negative golden rule. So it's a good rule to live by, but it's put in negative terms. Someone one generation before Jesus, a Jewish rabbi, put it like this. That which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. That's the whole law. But Jesus is said to have said, whatever you wish that others would do for you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And what's so striking about this as compared with the two previous ones is it's the positive formulation of the golden rule, which many people see as one of the most wonderful rules of life to live by. Now, either Jesus said it, or he had a really remarkable follower, follower who said it and credited Jesus with the intellectual property. I don't mind which one you want to say, but either one of those, it's a pretty remarkable thing attached to Jesus um, and it's got to be someone within one generation of Jesus uh, saying that. I'm writing a book at the moment, uh, trying to write a book on stories of Jesus, and they are the most remarkable stories. One of them is just under about 390 words, and it's a story of a prodigal son, a runaway son, uh, in Luke chapter 15. I'd urge you to read that. And one of the things I'm writing about is how it is one of the most amazing short stories there is, because it's a riff off the whole first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. It's got this father figure who... Um, uh, when his son comes back quickly, his uh, first word out of his mouth is quick, which is just like Abraham's first word when he has some guests. Get the fatted calf, which is just what Abraham said. And he riffs off this story of Abraham in Genesis. Uh, Jesus does in his story. But he also riffs off the story of Abraham's son, Isaac, because Isaac has two sons. It's a story about two sons, an older one and a younger one. And the older one's out in the field, just as in Jesus's story. And it's also a riff off the story of Jacob. Jacob's a son, younger son, who goes off into a far country with nothing comes about with everything. Jesus flips that on his head. And when a uh, younger brother comes back in Jesus's story, having cheated the older brother out of his inheritance, the older brother's really mad. And in the story of Genesis, the older brother um, Esau actually runs 
embraces him and kisses him, which is what the father does in Jesus's story. And then it's also got lots of things about the story of Joseph in, which is also in Genesis. So those are uh, four generations in a row. I've just given you there of uh, figs in Genesis. If you haven't read Genesis, go and read it. it doesn't take long. Three, four hours. Good fun. Um, is that it has um, there Joseph as the son who is lost and uh, is found uh, that his uh, father thought he was dead and who very quickly gets exalted in position, ring on his finger, robe, just like in Jesus's story. So what Jesus has done, and I'd love to spend you know days talking about this and I'll write it up at greater length, is he makes a really coherent story that many people would say is one of the best stories ever told. And yet it's full. And I would say every single phrase is a phrase that comes from this um, first book of the Bible. Now, to me, that's a level of storytelling genius that Jesus has. Now, how do we know Jesus told the story? Well, either Jesus told the story or someone within one generation of him told it. So either Jesus is a remarkable genius or he has these total genius disciples. The simpler hypothesis, of course, is to say that Jesus is the remarkable genius. So what I think I'm trying to try, trying to argue is that there are a whole load of remarkable things that cluster round Jesus, not just the empty tomb and people having seen him risen from the dead, but all sorts of other things. Um, one of them is this um, really related to his death. Uh, he dies, uh, as many people were crucified uh, back then, um, but he dies, it does seem, at the time when Jews were celebrating their greatest deliverance. This is not just in Christian sources, it is also in the Jewish source, the Talmud, where they say he died on eve of passover so of all the days you're going to um, die to sweep up the symbolism of the prior jewish texts which are talking about a promised deliverer that's a pretty good one so christians don't believe that jesus just died randomly they believe jesus died as part of a meaningful act where he was dying for sins now he was taking the punishment that the wrong things that we do deserve now you might not buy that message but it's pretty hard to make a plausible and compelling message out of just a random set of disastrous events. So if the early Christians, the earlier followers of Jesus got overtaken by events and they just ended up losing their leader who ended up getting crucified, actually having the ability to make a message out of that, which is such a compelling message that about two billion people follow it today, uh, and it does seem to make a lot of uh, sense of all sorts of things in terms of um, uh, God's compassion for our suffering, in terms of meaning in life, in terms of giving our lives for others. Um, all of that coming together, uh, it's quite hard to say, well, that was really just made up on the hoof over a couple of days, you know, a couple of thousand years ago. That doesn't explain very much to me. There's a little bit more we could look at. <clears throat> As a fellow um, 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 Humphreys, Sir Colin Humphreys over at uh, Selwyn College, who um, came up with this paper on the date of the crucifixion. He says, you look at the times when Jesus could have died, when it's going to be a Friday, and there are really only two dates within Pontius Pilate's time. And the best one uh, for a number of historical reasons is April the 3rd, AD 33. Um, and so they, these guys argue, one from Cambridge, one from Oxford, and they agree um, that that's the uh, date on which Jesus was crucified. What's rather remarkable is independent of those historical arguments. You can establish that as people sat down for their Passover meal at the big celebration in Jerusalem that night, that between seven, uh, sorry, 620 and 711, there was a lunar eclipse um, visible from Jerusalem, blood moon and all that sort of thing. And of course, there are texts in the Old Testament which are very evocative of that. So what I'm trying to say is this. Jesus's resurrection for Christians is not an anomaly. It's actually something that forms a pattern. It forms a pattern of God speaking to us. This is how one early Christian text puts it. Quite famous words. In the beginning was the word. So back at the beginning of everything, there was communication. The word was with God, somehow, alongside God, and the word was God. Aha, so God is a speaking God. And then, uh, a few verses later, it all saying, this is again in red, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and it explains that that's Jesus Christ. People often say, look, if God's there, why doesn't he speak to us? The answer a Christian would give is, he has. He's spoken to us 
in the best way that you can speak, which is in this per, in a person. There's no better way to communicate with persons than by persons. That's the way God has spoken. So when Christians argue for Jesus' resurrection, we're not arguing for something completely random. We're actually arguing for God speaking to us through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. So that's what I had to share with you. And I think it's time for questions. No, no, it's not. It's time for something else. But questions will be sometime. Yes. Questions uh, should be now. Hopefully everyone can see me um yeah so thank you so much everyone for sending your questions um just a reminder that the link is in the description um so if you can get to the pigeonhole link there then you'll be able to upvote questions that um you'd like to hear answered and type in your own as well um so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna go through um the ones that have been upvoted um and hear what um dr williams um would say in response to that um, so the very um, first question on the lot of votes is essentially about the birth of mm -hmm. Jesus. So, um, uh, Peter, you talked a bit about the uh, the similarities between the Old Testament um, and New Testament. Um, how do we know that Jesus was even born in mm -hmm. Bethlehem? Um, so this question asks, presumably there weren't many verifiable records of birth. So couldn't the gospel writers have read the passage from Micah and made up the Bethlehem yeah, great. story? And, and of course, the answer is um, yes. I mean, certainly in principle, um, that it's possible to imagine that some of these writers after Jesus are looking back to the prior scriptures and fitting their story with it. You can certainly imagine that. I think the difficulty I have with it, um, it is for other reasons that Christianity seems to spread quite far and quite fast. So by the time there's the great fire in Rome in the year 64, um, Tastus is talking about huge numbers of Christians in Rome and uh, Pliny later on, uh, you know, 112 um, up in Bithynia, huge numbers of Christians there. The Christian sources are also saying huge number of Christians here, there and everywhere. So if you start having things spread the Christians have to have some belief about where their hero was born. So if you start saying that round 30, 40 years after Christianity started spreading, that's when the idea that Jesus was born in Bethlehem really took off, then you have to imagine that there was some earlier belief which then got displaced. And that becomes quite difficult because of the dynamics of how things spread, because um, Christians are in a lot of chaos. They don't have good uh, means of, of of communication so how how are you going to get a unified set of beliefs where he's born in Bethlehem uh, both in, in two different sources Matthew and, and Luke uh, and I'd also say uh, argued in John um, how can you have that if uh, that isn't believed early on the other issue is that there are um, people who are family members of Jesus who are involved in Christianity early on now that might make you more suspicious but actually some of them like James, his half brother, um, who's mentioned in that passage we uh, read, um, arguably died as Christians um, early on. So that seems to be implied by Josephus, who talks about um, James getting killed in Jerusalem um, uh, around the year 62 um, for religious reasons. So it does seem that um, even though I'm a younger brother, a youngest brother, I, I think I know where my older brothers were born. It's something that's something we've just been talking about for a very long time. Um, so I would expect there would have to be some story that would be displaced. Um, and so that would be difficult. OK, uh, a, a question also related to that, um, talking about, um, yeah, the displacement of um, one version of events. Um, one questioner has asked um, if if many Jewish people were already seeing Jesus as this Messiah, as the saviour of the Jews, um, and so they, maybe they're already making these links, doesn't that suggest a lot of motivation for people to support the resurrection story regardless yep, of Yeah, thank you. Truth? Uh, and that's a, that's, a, that's a great idea. I mean, I think, I think the problem is um, this, that within Judaism, um, people did not expect a resurrection of one figure before everyone else. So normal Jewish belief would be there would be a resurrection of Jews at the end of time, or maybe of all people at the end of time. So it would not be standard Jewish belief at all that you would have one dude 
resurrected out of sequence with everyone else. Um, and in fact, you see this reflected in the early Christian accounts where people, when they see Jesus, their automatic reaction is, I'm seeing a Jesus lookalike. It must be an angel. I'm not actually seeing Jesus. Uh, and I mean, the other thing is that um, your best bet, if you want to have a Messiah to deliver you from the Romans, is to have a living one. I mean, really, you know, uh, deciding that one someone has just been defeated by crucifixion publicly and shamed and the Romans have been shown in their own terms to be in charge of everything um, is not the time to say, aha, now this is going to be our new mascot and hero for um, for the future. So I think that psychologically it's, it's not very compelling. Um, and also within Judaism, there's a very big problem um, thinking that God who made everything has become human. That is, uh, that, that is a very difficult thing to swallow. So I think actually belief in the resurrection is not something that would be um, something people would just come up with um, as a way out of a tricky problem of having lost their leader. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much for that uh, answer. Um, uh, another question we have um, that's been particularly popular um, is particularly thinking about the golden rule that you were talking about um, during your presentation. Um, so uh, the question reads, Confucius predates mm. Jesus. Is it the case that Jesus's golden rule is only a restatement of mortal ideas? Or are we to believe that the mortal Confucius attained wisdom equivalent Thank to you. the divine? Um, so I've got no problem with the idea that anyone articulated the golden rule before Jesus. Maybe they did, but we have no record of it. So, uh, and maybe Confucius came up with a positive golden rule, but we just don't have any record of it. I'm just saying this is one more remarkable thing about Jesus, that the very first person who's attributed, who has this rule attributed to them is Jesus. So either he comes up with it or he's got a very you know, smart disciple or who comes up with it and, and credits him. Um, so that's just, the way I'd, I'd see it. I think the golden rule stands on its own. And also the dichotomy between divine wisdom and hum human wisdom. I think for Christians, we believe that God um, has his image in every human. So actually, God puts wisdom within humans. That's why we expect um, that there will be wisdom in non-Christian religions. There are things to learn, according to Christians, and according to Christian scriptures, from um, el elsewhere, uh, because um, God has his image in everyone. So let's learn what we can from Confucius. Um, he, he came up with a good rule. Um, but what I would say is Christians do claim that Jesus uniquely is God who's become human. Great. OK. Thank you. Um, another question we have is a fairly broad one. So um, if we could hear your opinion, that would be great. Um, but this final question, um, apologies if there's any overlap or lag. Um, this, um, this other question is essentially, what do you think is the best alternative explanation for yeah. resurrection? I mean, it's very difficult uh, to do this. I mean, I think if I if I can talk about the Iraq war, uh, when we went to a war in Iraq, there was then an inquiry and then there were the inquiry didn't want to give too much blame to anyone. So they just spread out little bits of blame everywhere. I think if you were going to do it, the best thing is to try and just explain little bits, soften the impact of lots of different things rather than one grand um explanation so you, you just want to cast a bit of doubt here and there and i mean one of the key things for uh, people to recognize is that everything um if you want to um deny the resurrection you can so um the evidence isn't coercive in fact one of the points that the new testament would make is that um as people as jesus was dying for our sins on the cross and god was revealing his love for us people could stand under the cross and say, no, oh, that's pretty good evidence. He's a fraud because after all, he's being beaten by the Romans. So in other words, um, 
human ingenuity is such that if you want to explain away anything I've said or anything I, I could say over 10 hours, you can. I mean, that, that, that's just uh, the way things are. We've got to ask, though, whether that's 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 honest. So, I mean, I can if I needed to, if I wanted to, I could sort of explain away the resurrection. But then you can explain away an awful lot. I mean, people do that politically. People do that all, all sorts of ways. You can always explain away the other guy's evidence. I mean, it, 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 it's possible. But is it the honest thing to do? Thank you very much um, for that. Um, so we have um, another question um, which has recently come in, which is um, essentially asking, why is Jesus's resurrection um, as something that happened uh, or was uh, accounted to have happened in the, the these New Testament accounts? Why was that specifically showing Jesus's divinity when there were other figures that are um, accounted to have resurrected as well. Um, and this person lists, for example, um, Lazarus, right. Jairus' daughter. So I think on its own, the, uh, simply coming back from the dead, being resuscitated, that does not show that someone is necessarily um, divine. So I think it's um, the resurrection combined with everything else. Uh, so I wouldn't want to separate that out from Jesus' message, which is about himself, that he is the way to the Father God. Uh, that uh, he is the way, the truth and the life. And these sorts of claims that he is making, talking about himself as being in a special way, uh, the son of God, the deliverer of Israel and so on. So it's those things which combine uh, to make him uh, supreme in a way that um, anyone else coming back from the dead uh, is not. Great, thank you. Um, uh, another question we have is, um, do you think that uh, believing that the resurrection happened is dependent on believing in God? Well, I, I don't know if it has to be dependent on. Um, I think that, um, there are different ways into Christian belief. So you might come from belief in God to belief in the resurrection, or you might come from belief in the resurrection, uh, I, I think, to that's evidence for God. I mean, you could you could be intrigued by this mystery, by the person of Jesus. Um, one way of coming to believe in God is you look at the person of Jesus, read the Gospels, and find this is really remarkable and think, I, don't, I just don't think this is made up. I think this is real. Um, and that could be a reason to believe in God. So um, Christians don't believe in a sort of abstract God. So having those sort of arguments about, you know, do I believe in abstract God or not God um, may not be as interesting to a Christian as actually talking about the person of Jesus, who we'd say is God manifested, uh, God made clear. So I would say that you could probably go either way. The problem is if you have a hard atheism as your bedrock, you say there just cannot be any God, then you are compelled to explain away whatever evidence there might be for the miraculous anywhere. You're, you're compelled to explain away many arguments there are for meaning within events um, uh, in, in some forms of atheism. So um, that that's where I'd say watch those priors that, that you might be committed to. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're just going to go for a, um, a couple more questions. Um, uh, a very um, popular question, but a very uh, short question, I guess. Um, we've got one question here which says, has Peter read all the books on his bookshelf? <laughs> um, so just wondered if you oh, if only, on that. If only. No, I wish, wish I had. But I've got some very good funds up there. Yeah. And I'm giving away five shelves of, of, of books um, uh, as soon as the COVID restrictions are lifted. So if, if someone does want... Um, theology books, then uh, I, I've, I've, I need to make room for new ones. Thanks. Wonderful. Um, great. Um, so um, another um, question. Um, in fact, um, we probably do actually have time for two more onwards from this. Oh, yeah. um, so one question is, you mentioned um, <laughs> you mentioned um, that um, 
one of the arguments for the resurrection um, was the manner mm. of death of the disciples, um, yeah. especially in relation to the um, uh, yeah. the realness of their belief. Do we actually yeah. know how they So died? for some of them, like Peter, um, you have early accounts of him um, uh, dying by crucifixion and by Paul probably beheading. Um, but for a lot of them, we, we don't know. Um, we don't have very early accounts. They might be a century or two uh, later. But it does seem that on the whole, being a follower of Jesus early on could be pretty, pretty uncomfortable. Roman persecution was sporadic. It depend on local conditions, but it was on the whole uncomfortable. You weren't a protected group like um, others. So um, it was a very you know, tough decision to make. Great. OK. And the very final question um, that we're going to be answering. Thank you so much for um, all your answers so far, um, Dr. Williams, um, is um, if Jesus sacrificed himself for our sins, then why did he come back to life? So as Christians understand Jesus, he is um, God and man, uh, uh, fully God, fully human. Um, and um, he passed through death. But um, being immortal, he couldn't be held by death uh, forever. And it's quite important because um, um, his father's plan is to make him heir of everything. Um, and um, also to show that the sacrifice uh, that he had made was accepted. Uh, and uh, for Christians, it's pretty important that he's alive today and uh, that we can know him as our friend. So um, those are a few reasons. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much, um, yeah, to Dr. Williams for answering our questions. And thank you so much for all of you that have sent three questions. Uh, it's been really great to hear from you. Um, we'd just like to note here, um, we'll note at the end as well, um, if you do have any further questions, there's another link in the description box of the, um, the YouTube video that we're on right now, um, which um, says books, feedback and questions. Um, it can be an, as anonymous as you love it. If you have any further questions, would like to chat to someone um, about more of these questions, give any feedback, um, or um, yeah, uh, read some more books on this topic, um, one by Dr. Williams himself, um, then do um, fill that in. Um, and we'd love to hear from you. Um, at this point, um, we're, jo we're going to turn um, to speak to Abby, um, who's um, yeah going to talk to us a little bit um, about the so what. Um, we've just heard from Dr. Williams about um, the evidence and um, the rebuttal of, of various objections um, to this big claim of Christianity. Um, but a large question is, what relevance does that have to anything? Um, and so, Abby, it's lovely to have you here with us today. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, yeah, um, my name is Abby and I'm a second year and I'm studying theology at Gonville Keys College. Great. OK, so you study theology. So that means that uh, you look a lot at the Bible, um, at commentaries of the Bible, criticism of the Bible. Are you uh, convinced by the evidence for the resurrection? Yeah, yeah. I am. Right. OK, ha have you always been convinced? No, I don't think so. Um, and I can specifically remember a time where I also didn't really want the evidence to be reliable. Uh, and so it was a question that, yeah, I chose not to think about much. OK, thank you. So you said you don't want it to be true or reliable. Why was that, if you wouldn't mind telling us? A lot of it probably boils down to fear of the consequences. Um, yeah, it can be easy, especially when studying a subject like theology or history um, academically, to intellectually isolate questions of historicity and reliability from everyday life. But the resurrection uh, is an event that doesn't really allow for that in the same way as other historical claims. Um, yeah, and I think Pete touched on this, but that's because if Jesus really did rise from the dead, as he's recorded as predicting he would, then it's not something that you can just ignore. And, and he isn't just an ordinary person who you can ignore. And like, I found that really scary um, because especially as I began to experience more freedom as I grew up as a teenager, I really didn't want my life to be changed and I didn't want someone else to have a say in how I lived or what I did. 
Um, but if Jesus did rise from the dead, then I began to see that it would have to change everything. As Dr. Williams mentioned, um, yeah, Jesus had a claim to kingship and also claimed to be God. And the resurrection would mean that he wasn't just a person, but God. Because if what he said about rising from the dead was true, then so was everything else. And like, to be honest, I just didn't want a God ruling over my life. Okay, cool. So, so you said earlier that you do now trust the evidence for the resurrection. Um, so you now believe that this really did rise from the dead. What has changed between back then and the, the place you're talking about and now? Yeah, um, I think a lot of the change happened in my late teens. Um, and it's probably down to two main things. Uh, yeah, I began to both read more uh, of the accounts of Jesus' life or like read that more often. And also I began to meet more Christians, particularly Christians of a similar age to me. And as I did so, um, yeah, I began to see that the change that would have to happen in my life and the difference it would make if the resurrection had actually happened would be really good. Um, especially as I met and got to know Christians, uh, I saw that not only would death no longer have the final say if Jesus had risen over it, but also that life this side of the grave was greatly enriched. It wouldn't just be like a God lording himself over me. Um, but yeah, for my friends, Jesus' resurrection brought a genuine sense of peace and hope. And this didn't mean that they were free from the harshness and hardness of life, but yeah, that they had a hope through and beyond that. Okay, um, so so are you saying that the good consequence that you saw in the friends that you met, those good consequences made you forego the evidence? So did you just give up on rationality and logic at this point? No, it was more that the good consequences kind of gave me the courage to actually face the questions. Um, so it wasn't like I saw the good consequences and automatically believed. But whereas I've been scared to look into it because I was scared of the consequences the resurrection would have on my life, I suddenly saw that actually, if Jesus did rise from the dead, then everything changes and it's really good news. And so it's not just a claim to leave on the shelves, but something really worth questioning and investigating because if it's true then there's just so much to gain okay thanks so much for sharing with us abby uh, a very final question for you uh what would you say to people listening tuning in yeah i think the big thing that i'd encourage you to do um is to keep asking questions don't rest in apathy or let doubt or fear stop you from investigating. Um, the resurrection is a huge historical claim, but it's not just that, uh, because if Jesus did rise from the dead and is who he claimed to be, then everything changes. Um, I think practically I'd really encourage you, yeah, to, to, to try and get in touch with Christians. Um, Dorothy's gonna chat about some ways of doing that uh, and ask them questions, but also like, pick up an account of, of Jesus's life. If you're looking for a short read, Mark's probably, yeah, the best, it, it's really short. Um, yeah, and read it for yourself, ask questions, ask Christians questions, and just keep asking questions until you come to a conclusion, but don't, don't ignore it. Thank you so much, Abby. Um, and thank you for, um, yeah, the time that you've taken to um, answer, ask, answer some of our questions. Um, so that brings us um, largely to um, the end of our event. Um, thank you so much for tuning in um, and joining us at this first big questions um, of Easter term. We'd really love this not to be the end of the conversation. Um, on the YouTube video, as I mentioned in the description, there's a link to a feedback form. Um, we will put it in a Facebook event later, so you'll see it again. Really do feel free to fill it out. It can be as anonymous as you like, um, but you can order a book. Um, you can um, put yourself down to maybe chat with someone if you have any more questions or your email if you want to just ask more um, or just leave feedback if you'd love to just tell us what you thought of this event. Um, We've also got in this form a free virtual bookstore. As students, we love free things um, and free books. I mean, you've got to go for it. Um, and we've got um, a few there, including, as I mentioned, um, Dr. Williams' uh, written called Can We Trust the Gospels, which looks a bit more at the historical 
um, evidence and historicity of um, the account of Jesus' life. Um, we have um, Mark, which is one of those accounts, um, as Abby just mentioned. Um, and we also have another book called Confronting Christianity, which is all about confronting the biggest claims of um, Christianity, the biggest criticisms um, to Christianity. Um, and really um, has a go at thinking those through. Um, so yes, um, we'd love to um, chat to you more um, if you'd like that. Um, we'd love to see you at our next Big Questions event, which is in two weeks time on the topic or topic of Christianity, um, white Western religion. Um, and we'll have a panel of um, people and speakers to, to unpack that a bit more with us. Um, but it has been wonderful to have you. It's been wonderful to hear your questions and to engage with this big question together. Um, thank you everyone. Thank you for Dr. Williams and Abby for taking part and have a lovely evening, morning or afternoon, um, whenever it is that you're tuning into this. Thank you.